Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ 515 to 530. Therapy quote number 515. Think about the purpose of the symptoms. What does the symptom do for the person? That's a good quote, I think. Um, what does the symptom do for the person? All right? So, okay, it's defending the person against anxiety. Uh, maybe it's a transitional object. Maybe he um, couldn't deal with the separation and anxiety of the loss of somebody, so he created a symptom, and that served as a kind of bridge because it's unresolved. Acknowledging the loss was unresolved, uh, so the symptom expresses that unresolved anxiety, but at the same time the symptom takes away the anxiety, but it's a symptom, so there's a problem there. So it's a good question. Think about the symptom. What does the symptom do for the person? All right? It's a security blanket to represent the unresolved issue to, as defense against anxiety. If the body bears the burden, what burden? What inner conflict is the symptom masking or trying to serve as a compromise for the person? Um, yeah, Semrad, I, I look, apparently he was a very popular, respected uh, therapist. He didn't write any books or um, there's not much written material by him. But apparently he's sort of a household name in, in the therapy community. Apparently the therapists all flocked, they all wanted to study with him and be around him. And uh, he had all these little zingers he came out with. Well, his most famous one I think is, unhappiness is when you lie to yourself. So whenever you're lying to yourself, that's going to lead to unhappiness. What he's referring to I think is, when you, when you use a rationalization, that's a self-deception, to deceive others, to deceive others, that means you're using a rationalization to cover over a defense mechanism, some other defense mechanism, like splitting and projective identification or externalization or displacement, acting, whatever it is you're doing. So that means if you're lying to yourself, that means you're hiding the defense mechanism that's underneath it. And all defense mechanisms are used to deal with anxiety. Okay, psychic pain, anxiety is psychic pain. So his quote was, when you lie to yourself, uh, that's where uh, unhappiness comes from lying to yourself. So in other words, you're not facing your rationalization. You're not questioning yourself. Why am I using this rationalization? Why am I lying to myself? Or why am I, what am I doing in other words? So he's, I think he's most famous for that one. But he had some other ones, including this one here. Think about the purpose of the symptom. What does the symptom do for the person? TQ 516. If a client free associates in connection with the symptom, that is, says whatever comes to mind without holding anything back, sooner or later, that client will enunciate over strongly felt resistance a repressed thought or feeling that the symptom expresses. Yeah, so, so if you have a stiff uh, back or just talk about it and keep talking about it and eventually uh, it may reveal something about why the person has that symptom. Um, sometimes symptoms serve to TQ 517. His physical symptoms served to ward off fears of abandonment. So that's again so a previous, in a previous video, we had the, the quote about the person, uh, Mary Woodman, uh, a quote by her, she said, uh, the client uh, lost his mother, he was a mama's boy, and he couldn't, uh, he, was, he didn't know himself because he was too bonded with the mother. So when he lost the mother, instead of feeling maybe some kind of rite of passage or transition or something, he felt deep anxiety about the loss because he was identified with her. He felt like he was losing himself or something. So he couldn't let go of the mother. 
So the client developed a large, uh, he gained a lot of weight, and Marion Woodman interpreted that the weight was the mother, and he was carrying her around with him because he couldn't let her go. So it was that compromise formation. It acknowledged, uh, it dealt with the pain of losing the mother, but it created the symptom, and, the, and that symptom represents the unresolved issue with the mother. So it's something similar here, to ward off fears of abandonment. TQ 518. Pierre Janet conceptualized hysteria as a trance like disassociative state. So I'm including that as a symptom. If the person is sort of a little spacey or always absent minded and all that, um, that could be a symptom to trauma. That's a symptom of trauma. So, what does that symptom? Uh, express or do for the person. He doesn't want to be present. He doesn't want to feel in his body present because of that trauma. So it's it's the flight response to trauma, right? Um, so this association is when a person tries to escape when there's no escape. Right? Normally you flight or you protect yourself uh, and then if that's not available the baby will uh, disassociate. Now, long ago, uh, uh, th this term hysteria, it's a broad, general term. It comes in many forms. So nowadays, we might say narcissism is a form of hysteria, or, right, or any insecure attachment style. Um, so we don't use that term anymore. It, it's sort of branched off into several other terms, right? But long ago, that was the general broad term for something when someone was dysfunctional, right? neurotic or hysteric or so on like that. Um, okay, uh, one aspect to psychosomatic issues, uh, TQ519. James, too, believes that psychosomatic disorders reflect a failure of internalization in which a person seeks to relive the early unsatisfying object relationship. Okay, so there isn't that holding interject. Remember, in an insecure, with an insecure attachment style, the person doesn't acquire a holding interject, enough satisfying memories with the primary caregivers that coalesce and condense to form a psychic representation of the self and other that he can internalize that supports him. If he's missing that, it's a developmental trauma. So now he's getting these symptoms. And he's saying here, these symptoms reflect the lack of the holding interject, the internalized holding object. Right? With a secure attachment style where the loving memories outweigh the frustrating memories, by the age of three, the child internalizes all of these memories. Okay. Um, and that's called the holding interject, and that's his psychic structure. So with that psychic structure, uh, he's, he's healthy and relaxed, and his life force is connected to himself, the plumb line is to the self. If the, if the life force is connected to the rejecting image of the mother, he's caught in that developmental trauma, he's repeating things, because uh, he doesn't have that holding interject. And that can lead to stress, and the body bears the burden, and so on. So the symptom could represent a constant repetition compulsion of an early unsatisfying object relationship. Right? Just a theory. Like Robert Bly says, 30% of what you're about to hear is wrong. It's up to you to figure out which 30%. A proverb says, 520, he who teaches a boy teaches three. A young, a youth, a young man, and an old one. So there's the emphasis of um, how holding interject, okay, so the internalized good object relationship, if the mother loved the child and the child internalized, the baby internalized the mother's loving, soothing ministrations and functions and has that, now that's a part of him, it's part of his psychic structure, he carries that with him. So the mother taught the baby, okay, the boy carries it with him. Now, as a teenager, he still has that. He can handle the transition from boy to adult because he has that holding interject. Now he has that with him during his 20s and 30s and 40s and so on. 
and even into old age, he carries it with him. So important for the mother to provide a secure attachment style. If the mother offers the child an insecure attachment style, oh boy, you know, the child is missing that holding interject, and that can lead to symptoms. Okay, so these have been on a uh, little further quotes on the body-mind connection, the mysterious leap from mind to body, right, as they say. Okay, next we'll move on to 521. Regarding identification with the aggressor defense mechanism. No person would agree to function as an oppressor for an instant if the patterns of oppression had not first been installed and the person then manipulated into the oppressor role, right? The realization that oppression is usually internalized, if we can communicate it widely enough, will make a great difference in our work. So he's talking about the defense mechanism of the identification with the aggressor. If the baby is so impinged upon, if the mother is so imposing and so demanding on the baby, the baby can't handle it because of the psychic fusion and the lack of boundaries psychically. Uh, the mother impinging her thoughts and demands onto the child. The child can't absorb them, can't digest them or process them. Uh, it's too frightening for the child to constantly try to do it. Uh, what happens is the babies, because they're blurred there, it ends up that the baby identifies with those uh, impinging thoughts by the mother. That's called identification with the aggressor. That's the narcissistic pattern, right? So the person with the narcissistic pattern uh, is basically his mother, psychic in, in his psychic world, I mean. So he may uh, treat others the way his mother treated him. The mother always won up the child. The mother wanted to preserve her omnipotence. Now the person with the narcissistic pattern wants to preserve his omnipotence and he's putting others down and, and so on. Repetition, compulsion, gone awry. So he's repeating that, that developmental trauma. Right? The person with the narcissistic pattern doesn't know himself. He may create a pseudo uh, identity, but really underneath it, uh, he's identified with the aggressor. Um, to know oneself, the psychic representation of the self has to set, differentiate from the representation of the other. That only happens with a secure attachment style, right? Uh, if, if it's blurred there, the person doesn't know himself because his life force is attached, is too attached to the rejecting image of the mother, right? And in the extreme case, the person just identifies with the aggressor. That's the narcissistic pattern. And this author here, Jackins, you know, he's saying we need to talk about this more. Nobody really wants to talk about it. You know, uh, it's rarely mentioned. You know, uh, one brief way of talking about this defense mechanism, an immature infantile defense mechanism, maybe the child temporarily needed to use it, but like all infantile immature defense mechanisms, they're meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. If there's a developmental trauma, they still persist and they keep repeating, they get put on this record player, the person carries this record with him and keeps playing the record. He brings the past into the present. So he's transferring the past into the present all the time. He's caught in that repetition compulsion. But with a secure attachment style, all immature infantile, uh, infantile defense mechanisms that the baby may temporarily use to survive his childhood time, splitting, projective identification, identification with the aggressor, externalization, displacement, reaction formation, uh, acting out, um, nonverbal provocative behavior, these kind of uh, baby activities, you know, are meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. Because with the age of three, the psychological birth happens. Yesterday's quote was, man's task is to give to achieve uh, his own psychological, is to give birth to himself. The quote was, man's task is to give psychological birth to himself. Right? That's called the moral revolution. Right? So, okay, back to this, uh, you know, the, the baby is uh, resourceful. How does he survive an abusive mother? He becomes like her. Can't beat him, join him, kind of thing, you know. So he, uh, the baby becomes like her. But he loses 
He's himself. He doesn't know who he is. He's just her. He thinks that's who he is. He doesn't realize it's not him. You know? um, TQ522. His attempts to dominate the therapist with criticism and rejection in exactly the same manner in which it was done to him as a child. So that's an example of the client doing to another person what the parent did to him. So the parent was constantly domineering and critical to the child. The child identified with the aggressor. He grows up and now he always criticizes and is negative and puts others down, and just like the mother did to him. Burglar calls that a negative magic gesture. You're trying to communicate what was done to you. Why? Because the psyche seeks integration. It's trying to get you to be aware of it so you can face the unconscious ambivalence towards the mother uh, and then heal the splits to, to achieve whole object relations. Splitting precludes, uh, you know, splitting precludes love and gratitude. Klein says, uh, at the age of six months, with a secure attachment style, when there's differentiation, love and gratitude enter the psychological picture. Splitting precludes that. Okay, And to deal with the splitting, a person may identify with the aggressor. Or they may project the rejecting image of the mother onto others and then argue with that person, trying to master the trauma with the mother. Okay, But, but he's still preserving the split. He has, he's not healing the split. So that's why people with the narcissistic pattern don't you don't really see them, or, right? The general agreement is they don't they don't really see gratitude and, and uh, warmth and tenderness and empathy and all that, despite whatever presentation they may give. Um, that, that's where rationalizations come in. Uh, it's it's too painful to keep that uh, splitting going, so the person's gonna uh, rationalize his behavior, rationalize why he's acting like his mother. Come up with all sorts of excuses, equivocation, half the uh, half truth is the father of many lies, sins of omission, logical fallacies. He'll use every logical fallacy under the sun, probably. Uh, I imagine all those uh, uh, rhetoric uh, professors who studied rhetoric just listen to a narcissist talk, a person with a narcissistic pattern talk, just list them all down and then create names for what he's doing. So all those logical fallacies, lo logical fallacies, are the lies the mother used to make the baby dependent on her, because the mother is using the baby to meet her needs, all right? Because the mother didn't have the secure attachment style, so she's caught in the repetition compulsion, uh, and she's uh, that's intergenerational trauma. The mother didn't receive an insecure. The mother received an insecure attachment style, and she's doing that same thing with her child. That's why the moral revolution is to pause, reflect, uh, look, look at our rationalizations, and so on. So we can uh, face the ambivalence with the mother, achieve, okay, resolve the defense mechanism of splitting, then love and gratitude into the picture. Reparation of the other leads to reparation of the self, okay, and that leads to the psychological birth. Man's task is to give psychological birth to himself. With the psychological birth, we find access to the real self, the part of us that has various capacities, as mentioned in a previous video. And with those capacities, we, we live out of our uniqueness and our individual spontaneity, and our, we don't feel guilty. And like, so we're it's more uh, we're more integrated and we're more we're healthier that way when we come from the real self. If we're coming from the repetition compulsion of repeating the childhood drama all the time. That's not really our real, we haven't found our real self because we're still caught trying to master that childhood trauma. Right. Um, okay, uh, let's move on. TQ 523. Anxiety is an automatic physiological response to a perception of threat. Oh, still there? Okay, here we go. So, Remember, defense mechanisms deal with anxiety. So if we're easing up on using a defense mechanism, the anxiety may come up. So what's the threat? It's an unknown danger. It's, it's, it's the unconscious memory of the mother rejecting the baby. That's the anxiety. So most anxiety is 
the deep memory of the baby needing love and not getting it and feeling the danger from that. Right. So remember, anxiety is you're scared and you don't know why. It's usually from an internal memory. Right. To avoid these memories, we, we use all these defense mechanisms. Right. So we're not healing, we're just hiding. Right. We're, we're masking the trauma. We may need to, right? Until we're ready to, uh, to, to face our memories, right? Margaret Mahler says, Growing up is a gradual growing away from the normal state of symbiosis, of oneness with the mother. This process is much slower in the emotional and psychic area than it is in the physical. So as mentioned in previous videos, the biological birth and the psychological birth are separate phenomena. The biological birth, we see it, right? It happens in a minute. Uh, the biological birth, we create an, an extended womb from birth to six months. That's the stage of symbiosis. That's an extended womb. Humans come out of the womb too early, so we have this extended womb. It's meant to be as safe and warm as the actual womb, as much as possible. But as long as the satisfying memories, the entombment uh, outweighs the frustration, that's good, good enough. That's a secure attachment style. And at six months, the baby can slowly hatch out of the symbiotic egg. He can slowly hatch out of that womb, that extended womb. The biological boom, the hatching was immediate. In the psychological birth, the hatching process takes two and a half years, from six months to three years, roughly. Right. And uh, so she's calling this the growing up is the gradual moving away from the symbiosis with the mother, right? The oneness with the mother uh, to reach the psychological birth. In the psychological birth, the representation of other, the mother, first the mother, now other, it's separate and whole. And the same for the self, separate and whole. Okay, let's move on. Yesterday we did a little bit on reaction formation, so we'll continue with that. 525. Reaction formation, noun, psychoanalysis. Establishment of a trait or a regular pattern of behavior that is directly opposed to a strong unconscious trend. For example, uh, development of aggressive behavior as a means of repressing or denying fear. So throughout the series, we've had the odd quote about reaction formation. Also not talked about it much, not talked about that much, right? It's similar to identification with the aggressor. Everyone's saying, we've got to talk about it, so let's talk about it. So reaction formation is, the person has a wish, but it's too anxiety-provoking. But he wants to stay in touch with the wish or express the wish. Um, so for whatever reason, either internally it's forbidden or socially, externally it's forbidden, he wants to express the wish. How does he do it? He, he talks about it in its reverse form, or he acts it out in its reverse form. And that's his way to stay loyal to his wish. Um, so the example here is the person doesn't want to admit that he's uh, feeling anxiety or fear or something. Uh, so he does, the, he flips it, he acts the macho man, right, to, to, to deny what he's really feeling. And he doesn't know it. Right? Usually, usually this is unconscious. Um, so we had, the, we had previous examples of, uh, uh, in a previous quote, said that if somebody is against a vice, if they strongly say, you know, uh, vice such and such, whatever it is, fill in the blank, you know, uh, Smoking uh, is terrible. Da, da, da. Maybe that person, maybe, if he has ex exaggerated extreme opinions about that, a little unreasonable. Why is he so over over the top against? What's this about? Okay, that might be reaction for me. He's trying to say that he likes smoking, or he wishes he could smoke more. Or I'm just talking about any vice. Just that's just one example. Any advice. Um, a previous quote was. The mother said, yes, you got to feed the baby, put him on a schedule, this and this and this. Okay, that's because she wanted to love her baby, but she didn't know how. So she's expressing it in sort of this abusive way, you know. Punish the baby if you have to, but she really loves the baby, but she doesn't know how to do it. So that's called reaction formation. It's doing the opposite to what you really wish. 
I mean, you, you really wish something, but it's forbidden internally or externally. But to stay in touch with the wish, you vicariously stay in touch with the wish of it by talking about it or acting it out in, in its opposite form. Complicated defense mechanism. Again, meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. Reaction formation is also one of the infantile immature defense mechanisms, similar to identification with the aggressor. Right? Another way of putting it, 526. Reaction formation, asserting the opposite of an emotional reality, was um, her defense against losing a valued relationship. I think the context was... Uh, this is a common one in romantic comedies. The, the girl likes the guy and she doesn't want to admit it, so she says she hates him. That's her way of keeping the relationship with him. But she never likes the guy. She always hates him. But unconsciously she likes it. Something like that, you see. It's hard to know because it's, it's immature. That's what a baby might do. You know. Um, yesterday we talked about I statements. A person... Feeling that would say, you know, uh, the person would say to the other person, you know, when I now that I've gotten to know you, it's been I've known you for six months. Uh, I see you around. You say this. I say I notice. <laughs> so feelings and needs. That reminds me of my. I'm sorry. Okay, so she can make an I statement. In other words, okay, uh, a couple more. So we've okay. We'll do um, a previous. We started the thread on envy already. So we'll. Continue it not with uh, 527. Uh, this is uh, uh, a little bit of a longer one. Okay, TQ 527 on Envy. Uh, the preface to it is Why do um, some people, uh, if someone hurts someone, why do, they, why do they then hate the person they hurt? What's this about? Where is this Envy? See, remember. Love and gratitude enter the psychological picture at the age of six months. Okay, when you heal the splits, love and gratitude enter the picture. If that doesn't, if love and gratitude doesn't enter the psychological picture, and the splitting is still there, now you're into the envy and the the world of envy, and, and uh, hate envy and all that stuff, right? Okay, TQ five uh, twenty seven. on those who hurt others who then proceed to hate the ones they hurt. A variation of the technique of rationalization makes use of projection. Instead of guiltily hating oneself for having injured the other person, there is an unconscious shift which directs the hatred at the person who has been injured. Okay, so that part right there, you see, someone hurts someone, uh, they can't feel guilt because Love, gratitude, guilt enter the psychological picture with whole object relations. Splitting precludes the feelings of guilt. Okay, there's just envy and hate. There's no guilt. M remember someone's joke was only the good feel guilty? It means you, you, have, you have achieved whole object relations. Right. So with this defense mechanism splitting still there with that developmental trauma, the person doesn't feel something like guilt. You see, so, or if he does, it's so repressed. Um, so what does he do? Uh, instead of feeling guilty, he's going <laughs> to blame the other person as a defense mechanism. Right? Again, a variation of the technique of rationalization makes use of projection. Instead of guiltily hating oneself for having injured the other person, there is an unconscious shift which directs the hatred at the person who has been injured. This is so typical and recognizable a mechanism that references can be found to it in classical as well as contemporary literature. Quote, whom they have injured, they also hate. Seneca. It is a principle of human nature to hate those whom you have injured, Tatticus. Forgiveness to the injured doth belong, but they never pardon who have done the wrong. He that does you an injury will never forgive you. Men hate whom they hurt. 
Why do you hate that man so much? Why? Look here, it is true that he did me no harm, but I committed a crime against him that my conscience will not forget, and immediately afterwards I hated him because of that deed. The brothers, okay, Dostoevsky. Okay, this was found in a quote, uh, this is a quote by Edmund Burglar. I'll have to add that there. So Burglar, he's good with quotes. He, he compiles a lot of quotes from literature to make his points. So, again, uh, like that character in the novel by Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky he, this character is saying, yes, I know, uh, he did me no harm, and, and I hurt him, but now... I can't face the pain of that. I, it, I haven't achieved the psychological birth. I'm still in the splitting defense mechanism. There's a lot of pain there. I have to keep that there. How do I keep that splitting there? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll just blame that other person. What? It's a delusion. But he's trying to preserve the split because he can't face the developmental trauma of the mother hating him more than loving him or rejecting him or being unavailable to the baby more than being available to the baby. The person doesn't face that, so the splitting is still there. So how does he deal with the split? So we use projection and rationalization. So he's externalized his problem. Right? Um, so he blames the person he hurt, because that person reminds him right, of, of uh, how he acted out his splitting defense mechanism. You see, it's such a, it's so important to heal this splitting defense mechanism because others are being hurt by it. Um, and the projector is caught in the developmental trauma of the repetition compulsion of where the mother as a baby, where, where the person as a baby received more frustrating memories than loving memories, and thereby keeping the split still there. Splitting is meant to be a temporary defense mechanism the baby uses from birth to six months. It, it gets resolved by six months and it gets fully resolved by the age of three. It's a gradual process. But that six months is key. So all of these quotes from literature are talking about people stuck in that envy because splitting, that's what the envy is. You, you hate the good because, you, because the person didn't get enough good so he hates the good. And remember from the previous video in the psychic representation, goodness is the the prototype was the breast, an inexhaustible flow of goodness. Okay, the baby needed that, the baby never got it. So now beyond the age of five, that turns into greed because it's insatiable, because you can't go, that's a repetition compulsion gone awry, you can't travel back in a time machine to get the love he needed. Okay, and then if he sees the good, uh, he may be greedy, uh, or he'll just be envious, or there's both, Grenby. He'll take take what he can and then hate afterwards. See, it's such a horrible, horrible situation. There's so much literature about this throughout the ages, trying to understand where does this envy come from, okay? Klein is saying it's the defense mechanism of splitting causes this. The frustrating memories with the mother outweigh the loving memories of the mother. Thereby, the splitting is still there. When the splitting is there, the rejecting image of the mother is denied, disassociated, rejected. Okay, But no one can completely make it go away. It's a part of you. It goes in the bag we drag behind us. Right? Uh, it's the one that walks with us, who's not like us, who is us. It's part of that. So a person can deny something, but it's still a part of him. You know. So... Um, so Burglar describes it as uh, it, it, the person using, see, he doesn't directly talk about splitting and projective identification. He's, he's just simplifying it. He's just saying, well, uh, I'll project the hatred I should feel. You see, um, if someone, if a baby hurts the mother and he loves the mother at the same time, he'll feel bad about it because you, you always feel bad if you hurt to someone you love okay that's the ambivalence there but splitting precludes that he doesn't ha he hasn't reached that developmental accomplishment he hasn't reached that stage right so 
uh, what is he going to do? Uh, he hurts someone. He can't feel guilty. But there's psychic pain there. So he's going to externalize. He's going to preserve the split. Instead of being angry with himself for hurting the person he hurt, he's going to blame that other person, and that keeps the split there. He's staying. That he's stuck in that very, very primal kind of inability to love and hate at the same time, or to feel badly if you hurt someone you love. You know. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I told you, envy is the, probably the toughest thread in this series. I thought projective identification and splitting were the toughest one, but I think envy is turning out to be the toughest one. <laughs> a brief way of saying it is 528. The source of envy in the envier is some narcissistic wound. The dynamic of this defense accounts for the dyadic nature of the object of envy as opposed to jealousy. So again, envy always talks about a two-person relationship, the baby and the mother. It's just two people. When people talk about jealousy, that's a more advanced stage. Uh, it's not, jealousy is not as bad as envy. Jealousy is just you have something and you feel a pang of pain of losing something to someone else or something. But it doesn't... It's not an existential, frightening situation. It's just a bad feeling for a short time. It goes away. Envy is part of the empty psychic structure. Envy relates to the missing, holding interject uh, and the need for mother's soothing internal presence, which never got put in there into the person's psyche. So there's that emptiness, there's that hole we say, or, and so on. So people with a narcissistic pattern, they, we always say they have this hole inside, you know, this black hole in the psychic world, you know, because they didn't get the holding interject. So they identified with the aggressor to deal with the empty hole, the emptiness. Um, yeah, one quote, one quote said, uh, that person doesn't have the self-esteem to be jealous. It's only envy. That's why it's confused. Sometimes the person may say, oh, he's jealous. No, he's, that's envy. If it's very intense and relates to his coreness, relates to that emptiness, relates to the splitting defense mechanism, so that's that's the envy. Uh, he may present it as jealousy or say that he's being jealous, uh, but the person with the narcissistic pattern is not jealous. The people with the narcissistic pattern, those with the hostile provocative attachment style, and other uh, developmental arrest prior to the age of 18 months, or prior to six months or one year around that that, that earlier stage, uh, they're not capable of jealousy. It's just envy. After 18 months, let's say, uh, there, there can be jealousy there. The person doesn't feel envy. They may feel jealous, but not envy. All right. So envy is way more intense. Jealousy is milder. Okay, back to Burglar 529. Rationalizations, projections, and the, re and the rest of the melange of self-excuses to which every person unconsciously resorts are all stopgaps. The individual can fool himself and can fool others, but his inner arrested development remains. Okay, again, so we're just... So these rationalizations and projections and all that, excuses, lying to yourself, lying to others, repetition compulsion... That's a stopgap. That's it's not. You're not really dealing with the with the leading issue, the underlying issue, which is which is the developmental arrest. Okay, and Klein says that's the splitting defense mechanism is still there. Okay, and if that's still there, if that's still there, then infantile megalomania is still there. All right. Lastly, uh, we'll end on a poetic note. Know then thyself. Presume not God or someone else to do that for you. The proper study of mankind is man. Okay. <laughs> that was a great little line there. The proper study of mankind is man. The proper study of mankind. So, okay, so in other words, know thyself. And uh, uh, yesterday's quote was... Uh, Man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. To do that, he has to know himself, and so on. Okay, so so we did a little 
uh, a bit more on envy and uh, we covered the body-mind issue and a uh, little bit on identification with the aggressor. So all of these quotes are adding, all of these quotes add on the previous material and we'll have more to follow on these topics. Um, we began with SEMRAD. Okay. <laughs> what does the symptom do for the person? Various theories about that. It does something for the person. Other, otherwise, why, why is it there? It's helping the person to deal with the anxiety, to deal with loss, it's a security blanket in some, in some way. So, it's doing, so there is a secondary gain. There is some benefit to the symptom, but it's, it represents an unresolved pain, so it represents the pain as well. So the symptom represents pain and dealing with the pain at the same time, you know. Um, and then 516 gave the example that uh, if, if you talk about your symptoms, uh, it'll come, it may come out what that symptom represents. Yeah, a uh, quote, uh, reference to Pierre Genet, he was one of the early ones. He talked about that disassociative phenomena. Um, he emphasized more about disassociation. Right? We don't talk about it so much. Philip Bromberg sort of brought it back. He has three great bro uh, books, Philip Bromberg. Uh, he's the guy that wrote uh, the, sh the sh uh, that... Uh, Trauma is an um, emotional tsunami, and the after effects of it he calls the shadow of the tsunami. It's a very good book. And he had a whole list of phrases describing the dissociative response to trauma. A very good uh, collection. Um, yeah, all three of his books are good. Yeah, and uh, TQ519, one famous uh, author says that... Uh, Psychosomatic symptoms represent the missing holding interject, so the body bears the burden. If you have the holding interject, that's self-soothing there. You have that internal structure of soothing yourself, because the mother soothed you. The mother comforted you, now you can comfort yourself. The mother didn't comfort you, how do you comfort yourself? Now you're getting into emotional eating and, and, and other things, right? Yeah, the proverb... If you teach a boy, you're teaching three people. You're teaching the boy, the youth, and the adult. You know. That relates to the internalization. Yeah. Identification with the aggressor we covered here. Narcissistic patterns about that. If you do to others what was done to you, that's the identification with the aggressor mechanism. You're trying to communicate the distress. Right. But no baby can say to his mother, Hey, mother, are you doing to me what was done to you? No baby can be the therapist for the... But the mother's trying to communicate what happened to her. That's that's a positive intention. She's trying to communicate, but it's acting out. It's nonverbal. Right. So either we act out and don't remember, or we talk and remember. Like uh, five sixteen says, if you talk about it, you'll remember it. Right. And then uh, we had uh, five. Uh, what's the other one? Five twenty three. Oh yeah, anxiety is. Um, an automatic physiological response to a perception of threat. Most of the time, that perception of threat is internal. It's the, it's the memory of when mother wasn't available. So it's the memory of loss of love or memory of abandonment. Most anxiety is uh, the unconscious memory of mother not being around when you needed mother and the fear from that. As an adult, it doesn't make sense, but from think about it from the baby's point of view. Okay. That's a template, that's a stencil in the person's psyche. So the person's coming from that point of view. So anxiety is from that point of view that the baby had back then. Yeah, Ma Margaret Mahler says, there's a difference between biological birth and psychological birth. Man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. Right. A little bit on reaction formation. We'll add, we'll add more on those. And uh, we ended on the top topic of being <laughs> Oh boy, right? <laughs> and uh, I ended on the poetic note, man, the proper study of man is man. <laughs> okay, all of these quotes are posted below. 
Uh, okay, I guess I'll just uh, leave you here for today. So thank you very much. This has been TQ 515 to 530. More to follow. I don't see the Blue Jay. I was hoping he might make an appearance. Maybe we'll see him tomorrow, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye for now.